I'm Mark Hensel and I've been asked by Fabrizio Bernardini of Bizitalia to give a talk on spacecraft systems engineering. And since I have spent my whole career either practicing or teaching spacecraft systems engineering, it is a subject on which perhaps I ought to have something to say. Systems engineering is still not widely taught in engineering degrees, which I find rather strange given its importance in nearly all industries these days. Even those engineers who do not actually do systems engineering themselves are most likely to be working in an overall system engineering environment. And as a consequence, most engineers pick up some level of understanding about the subject on the job. But this understanding is often patchy and not related back to any theoretical basis. So I'm going to start this talk by going back to basics as to what system engineering actually is to make sure of the foundations before we rush into the spacecraft bit. OK, let's start really basic. What is a system? The word has a sound that evokes flair in a land, so of course it comes from Italy, to be precise from Latin. And generally it means two things that work in harmony, like two musical notes, or the harmony of the heavenly bodies in the celestial sphere, hence solar system. But for our purposes we need something a little more precise and focused. So for engineering purposes we use a definition like this. A system is a set whose elements interact with each other to create emerging properties. Now inherent in this definition is the system model, which is shown in this diagram. We have the elements that make up the system, separated from those things that are not elements of the system by the system boundary. The boundary being a consequence of however we have defined the set. So far, that is just the mathematical meaning of a set. What makes a system different from other types of set is that in a system these elements are connected to each other. We call these connections interfaces. And through these interactions they do things together that they cannot do alone. This is the emerging properties. The concept of emerging properties is sometimes difficult to grasp. So let's have a quick look at it in action. Here I have an acoustic guitar. And in the right hand it can make music. OK, these might not be the right hands, but you get the point. Now here I have an electric guitar. And in the right hands, even in the right hands, this clearly cannot make music. But here is an amplifier. Again, by itself it can't do anything except maybe be an expensive doorstop. And here is a loudspeaker. Again, by itself it doesn't do anything. But if we consider them as elements of a system, and they are correctly connected together by the correct interface, the quarter inch jack, and then we connect it to the outside world with the correct systems interface, the PowerPoint, then we have a system that can make music. Well, maybe depending on how you define music. OK, you may be saying, got that, but surely the same thing can be said for the acoustic guitar. The strings do nothing by themselves, the fretboard does nothing by itself, maybe the body could be used as a drum, but only when they're connected to together do they become a guitar. So is the acoustic guitar a system? To take this thinking further, I heard a story that when a senior member of the UK's Defence Research Agency heard the definition of a system for the first time, he said, well, that is meaningless. It could be as well applied to a pair of boots. So is a pair of boots a system? Well, the answer in both cases is if you want them to be. But to explain that answer, we need to consider the history of engineering progress. We humans are animals uh, that have two differentiating abilities from other animals, and they are probably linked. One is the sophisticated use of language. The other is sophisticated tool making. That is engineering things that have a purpose, like this guitar. Now, although this particular guitar was produced in a massive factory, one person can make a guitar. In fact, if you want a really good instrument, you would go to a skilled Lutherer who will probably be working alone. And that's how engineering started. 
individuals making things single-handedly by themselves, either for themselves or for the wider community. Now to do this, the individual has to have both an understanding of the item being made and the time and strength to make it. Now at some time, mankind learned to work together, to organise themselves, to share labour in order to make things that no one person would have the time or strength to make by themselves. Things like pyramids. Now everyone can understand it, after all it is just a pile of stones, but no one person could build it. Or medieval sailing ships. Again, everyone making it could understand how it worked, but it's way too big for one person to actually make. Or aircraft like the Spitfire. Now, as these examples show, as time progressed, so the things that mankind has been making have become increasingly complex. But although they require large teams to split the work effort, still everyone on the team could understand the whole. The Spitfire is an interesting example. Here is a quote from its designer. If anybody ever tells you anything about an aeroplane which is so bloody complicated you can't understand it, take it from me, it's all bollocks. Well, Mitchell was known for his um, earthy, intemperate language, but basically he's saying that people on the team, and in this case it was the test pilot, should be able to understand the whole aircraft. And at that stage of aviation technology, I think he's right. But I also think that the aircraft that entered World War II, like the Spitfire, are on the limit of this process. If you had a degree in aeronautical engineering, then you had been trained to understand everything about an aircraft as sophisticated as a Spitfire. But the pressure of the war on technical developments changed that. As Grace Hopper puts it, life was simple before World War II, after that, we had systems. And there are two areas of technology in particular where this problem revealed itself. One was aviation. Take, for example, the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. This had a massive development effort, which was actually 50% more than the Manhattan atom bomb, which, of course, it was later used to drop. It had computer-controlled gun turrets, cabin pressurisation system, friend foe identification, radio navigation, blind landing systems, and indeed an entire complex suite of what we would now call avionics. In short, it was way past one person's ability to understand how it all worked. The other area that faced the problem was electronic computing, a field that was actually born during the war. And indeed, the term systems engineering seems to have been first used in the 1940s at Bell Laboratories in the context of computing. So, during the Second World War, things got too complex for one person to understand. Humanity had reached what is called the complexity barrier, and using the system model was the way that we broke it. So now we can answer the question, is a guitar or even a pair of boots a system? Well, in one sense, yes, in that you can apply the systems model to them. But is your intellectual capability so limited that you need to do that? Well, I would hope not, or the rest of this lecture is going to be completely lost on you. What makes a system is not any property it has in the real world, but that it is something that we need to impose the system model on because it's too complex for us to understand otherwise. It means that someone as intellectually challenged as a guitarist can collect the elements of a guitar, amplifier and speaker and bring them together to create an electric guitar system without having any understanding of how they work or any ability to make them. All he or she needs to understand is the role of each element in creating the emerging properties and the interfaces. The development of system understanding in the mid-20th century is an extremely important moment in human progress. I would argue from the history that I've just outlined that there are three pivotal thresholds in human engineering capability. The first threshold is the ability to make tools, which probably happened around four million years ago before any species that we would define as hominid actually existed. 
The second threshold is the ability to organise labour to make big but simple things. We do, do not know when that development first occurred, but I suspect it was very early in human history, maybe tens of thousands of years ago. Finally, in the mid 20th century, we reached the third development threshold when we found a way not only to distribute the workload amongst many people, but also share the understanding of the object by treating it as a system. Now, no one person needs to have a full understanding of everything. That understanding is distributed within a cooperating group. This new ability is less than a century old. So I think we have yet to see or even understand its full potential. But it is quite exciting to think what humanity can achieve when the constraint of what a single human mind can comprehend is removed. And this systems thinking is not just applicable to engineering. It can also help in sciences where we need to understand the complexities of living things, subjects like biology and ecology. An approach that was exemplified by James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis in the 1970s. However, the comments on this work highlighted a subtle but important philosophical difference between using systems models in science and using them in engineering. Here we have a bird, specifically a red kite. Now, clearly this is as complex as any man-made aircraft, and we could use a system modelling approach to gain an insight into how it achieves such elegant flight. But is the red kite a better bird than, say, a robin or a swan or indeed any other bird? Well, we might say that a robin is cuter or that a swan is more elegant, but these are just projecting our personal aesthetics onto these birds. We cannot make objective statements about their relative merits because they're just natural objects that simply exist and have no defined purpose. Now let's just look at how this video was taken. It was taken from this drone, which can not only do some spectacular flying of its own, but also at the same time can track objects automatically to video them. This is clearly also a very complex system. But can we objectively say that this drone is better than another drone? Well, yes, we can, because drones are built with a defined purpose by the people who created it. And we can judge it against that purpose. This is a process known as validation. This is the difference between science and engineering. Science explores the universe we find ourselves in with the goal of trying to understand it. Engineering changes that universe to meet purposes that are defined by us human beings. Systems engineering is the application of the system model to the engineering of complex objects that humans have created to fulfil a purpose. And here we come to the magic bit. What if that purpose is to travel in space? Then we have what in popular culture is called rocket science, a ridiculously inaccurate term as rockets are just a part of the totality of flying in space and their creation is by definition engineering, not science. I'm not even sure that you can study natural propulsive systems unless it's a squid water jet and I'm pretty sure no marine biologist has ever called themselves a rocket scientist. The term rocket science came about in the 1960s when the Apollo program became a paragon of what mankind could achieve. But what really made the Apollo program possible was the new and sophisticated systems engineering approaches it employed. So what people actually mean by rocket science is spacecraft systems engineering. Now let us be clear here these system approaches to very complex projects were not invented by the space industry. They were much more the product of the nuclear missile programs of the time, in particular the Polaris program. But of course, those were developed in strict secrecy. What the Apollo program did was to bring them into the public eye in a most spectacular way. So space has been important in highlighting the power of systems engineering to the wider world. But conversely, systems engineering has had an important role in making spaceflight possible. Indeed, I would argue that astronautics is the first human endeavour when systems engineering is an essential capability to have before it can be undertaken. Let me expand that thought. 
We often hear about how difficult and dangerous spaceflight is, as if it is an inherent and inevitable consequence of the space environment. And this is an impression that we rocket scientists often like to encourage, to emphasise how brave and clever we are at tackling such a challenging task that is way beyond the capability of mere mortals. And of course, it also helps excuse our goofs. But I'm afraid I do not agree with that assessment of space engineering. I would argue that space is not difficult or dangerous, it's just different. The space environment is actually a relatively benign and predictable place to design for. The problem is that it is also very different from our experience of how things work on Earth, which if you think about it rationally, has far more unfriendly environmental problems like wind, rain, a corrosive atmosphere, earthquakes, etc. But we do not see these as difficult or dangerous problems because we are so familiar with them. We have grown up with an understanding of how things work on Earth. Indeed, part of that understanding is actually hardwired into our brains through millions of years of evolution. So to do things in space, an engineer has to actually unlearn their intuitive understanding. But if you do this, and we learn how to engineer in space, it should be possible to make things that are at least as reliable and safe as the things we make on Earth. After all, we are already quite capable of making complex spacecraft that work for decades without any servicing, which is something we can rarely manage on Earth. The implication of this view is that the knowledge of how to make the various elements of a spacecraft is more specialised. So the need to use the system model to distribute the understanding of a spacecraft amongst a team of specialists kicks in earlier than it would with a terrestrial system of comparable complexity. Aviation got as far as the Spitfire without any formal systems engineering. But my belief is that astronautics would not have got to even Sputnik 1 without formal system engineering approaches. And as a consequence of this dependence, the space industry is rather good at it. For example, I would highlight this, the superb NASA Systems Engineering Handbook. This rather large tome has a veritable cornucopia of system engineering techniques, but be warned, you do not have to always do all of them. These are suggestions to the wise, not instructions to the foolish. Obviously, we cannot look at them all now, but I thought we could look at the system life cycle. The system life cycle is the progression of the system through its developments and operations in an analogy to the life cycle of living things, as exemplified by the Oscar nominated song Circle of Life by the popular beat musician Elton John. In reality, the system life cycle isn't really a cycle but what is known as a waterfall process. As the phases progress, so the system model is progressively refined as the system is developed, operated and decommissioned. All industries using system processes have variations of the system life cycle, and here is NASA's. Now, if you've been in the space industry for any time at all, you will have picked up on phase A, phase B, etc. But be aware that this terminology is unique to the space industry and more specifically to the Western space agencies. It was, after all, invented by NASA in the 1960s. Now, it's changed over the years since then, sometimes for the better, like picking up on ESA's separate phase F for decommission, sometimes for the worse, as it drifts away from a classical system life cycle. And here is the ESA version. Although the overall picture is the same, it differs significantly in detail, something to be aware of if you're on a transatlantic agency programme. This ESA version is closer to a classic systems life cycle, so I am going to use these titles for the rest of the lecture. But I'm also going to subtitle them with what I consider the classic, more theoretical terminology, and highlight why they are different, and how, in my view, why that is not always a good thing. The point here is that the classical system life cycle follows a progressive refinement of the system in logical steps. It's like bringing the system into focus. Each phase adds more detail to the system model while retaining consistency with the overall original blurry picture. So let's start at the top 
with pre-phase A, or phase zero as ESA prefers to call it. These are the future studies, or concept studies in NASA speak, and they are explorations of what is possible and what is desirable, and even occasionally what is needed. Although these are not formal, separately funded projects in their own right, they are the seed from which such funded projects grow. In the space industry, these studies tend to have a mission emphasis. ESA actually calls it mission analysis. And while this is sometimes valid, I think we're missing a trick by not looking more at achieving functionality goals, particularly in infrastructure systems. We end up continually developing new space systems with very limited roles, hence small production runs, and hence the whole space enterprise is expensive to a legendary degree. Anyway, these studies, which can be run by space agencies, other spacecraft customers, but also spacecraft producers with a view to garnering customers later. Whoever undertakes the study, what they should be producing is listed here. The most important being the system purpose, the short, preferably one sentence outline of what the system is supposed to be doing with itself. You may have noticed that throughout this talk I have been emphasising that engineering is about people making things that have a purpose. So you may well question if a thing does not have a purpose, is it engineering? Certainly, as the discipline of systems engineering has advanced, we have learned that the purpose should be a formal phrase that is the seed from which the whole system life cycle is derived. But because the system purpose can end up a little imprecise, we also expand it into objectives. Not many, around five is normally enough, and these objectives interpret what the purpose means. That is, if these objectives are met, then the purpose is fulfilled. That in turn places a requirement on the objectives to be measurable. In short, what is needed at this stage of the project life cycle is not a clear vision as to what the system looks like, but what it is supposed to do. Now, I'm as guilty as the next future studies engineer of concentrating on the technical details of concept designs, the third output. And I know customers just love those sexy photorealistic images that help sell the concept. But the problem here is that in current concept studies within the space industry, these outputs dominate the study output. And it can often be difficult to find what the system purpose is supposed to be. That is, if the team even remembered to produce one. And that can prove a big problem later when it comes to validation. There are two key methodologies by which a system's success can be measured. The first is verification, which is how well the system meets the requirement specification that was produced in phase A. Contractually, this is very important, as it is the basis on which we get paid, and it is also how we stay out of the courts. As a consequence, industries tend to emphasise verification, and the life cycles used by the space industry are particularly strong at ensuring success by this measure. But ultimately, more important, is validation. That is the measure of the degree to which a system meets its purpose. And this is notoriously difficult to evaluate. I was once at a meeting that was discussing the requirements for a new doctoral level course in systems engineering. Half the meeting was arguing systems engineering was very successful and we should be ensuring that we pass on these successful techniques. The other half was arguing that systems engineering was largely failing and we needed the research to improve things. It was only afterwards I realised that the optimists were thinking verification and the pessimists were thinking validation. So validation may be difficult to achieve even in the best of circumstances, but if there's no defined purpose with its accompanying measurable objectives, how can you even start to assess it? So, assuming your concept designs were sexy enough and that the optimistic twaddle justifying the project was convincing enough, you may end up at the start of a real funded project. We have reached phase A. Now I do take issue with the ESA terminology here. There should have been a good deal of feasibility assessment in the concept study. Otherwise, why are you starting to spend real money? And the feasibility should not be the key output of phase A. 
The NASA title is worse. Concept and technical development. What the hell is that supposed to mean? The concept should have been established in your concept studies. And the technical development is something that's going to occupy all four of the development phases. What the initial phase of a project should really be doing is producing the requirements. Yes, of course, it should also be assessing the feasibility of those requirements. But the key thing is to produce a requirement specification. A requirement specification takes the purpose and its accompanying objectives and unpacks them into a measurable set of requirements that will define the system. Now, of course, this can be a little tricky if there is no clear purpose or objectives, but our industry has become very adept at fudging this issue so long as you do not look too closely at validation. The most important point here is that the requirement spec is the definition of the system boundary. It defines what is in the system and what is not. And it should also define all the system interfaces. So to repeat, it defines the system. So the requirement specification is by far the most important document in a system project. An importance that is amplified by the fact that it is the interface between the customer and the producers or stakeholders and players, if you prefer those terms. Now, I do not think that we are doing a very good job in the space industry at requirement specifications, given their importance. And I would give three pieces of advice. The first is to have the purpose and the objectives recorded at the start. OK, not as part of the specification itself, but as background to it. It is the last chance to agree and record the purpose and the objectives and do it in a document that will last throughout the many years that a project typically takes. The second suggestion is keep it short. There is a tendency to produce massive specifications of many hundreds of pages to show how much work has been done and to try and cover everything contractually. This last is a completely futile exercise as such a large document will inevitably contain contradictions. But the key thing to understand here is that every requirement is an increasing cost. So make sure you pare it down to the bare minimum and do not end up paying for things that you do not really need. My friend and mentor Bob Parkinson once gave a conference paper on the benefits of keeping requirement specifications to a single sheet of paper. The conference chair was much taken with this idea and he saw the legendary Ernst Stuhlinger sitting in the front row, a venerable figure then in his 70s who had started out as part of Von Braun's team at Pienemunde. Ernst, the chair asked, I seem to remember that the specification for the A4 rocket was on a single sheet of paper. Dr Stuhlinger thought for a moment, carefully weighing the question. Then he shook his head and replied, no, it was on half a sheet. Well, a requirement specification on a single sheet of paper may be a little difficult in the modern world, but I would still offer it as an aspiration. My final advice is to make sure that there are no technical solutions, either explicitly or implicitly contained in the requirements. They should just be statements of need. This is very difficult for engineering teams who are looking at their feasibility designs and are sure they know how the thing should be made. But they must resist this impulse, which brings us on to concept and feasibility designs. This is another subject rather dear to my heart, as I just love doing them. As the name suggests, concept designs are produced in phase zero and feasibility designs in phase A, but they are doing the same thing. They show through a system design that what is being asked for in the system purpose and the system requirements can be achieved in real life and at a cost that can be afforded and represents value for money, the cost coming from parametric costing of the system design. If you're doing them properly, then they should not be assumed to be candidates for the final design. Indeed, they should be positively excluded for two reasons. The first is that they should be conservative using the lowest technology that can meet the requirements. If a design is conservative, so are the key parameters that will be derived from it. Most importantly, of course, cost. If this design is conservative, the final design, which will be much more optimised, should have no nasty surprises in store as the project unfolds. On the subject of optimization, we come to the second reason why you should not use feasibility designs. There should be a rule of no trade-offs 
in a feasibility design. A feasibility design should dig down, not spread out. It is in the detail that you find the problems and the hidden issues. And also, this is where you are learning about the system. I would argue that until you have done a deep, detailed feasibility design, you actually do not know enough to perform a valid trade-off anyway. So trade-offs are for phase B. As a consequence, my third piece of advice is that once phase A is over and you have the requirement specification, then burn the feasibility design and in particular do not publish it with the specification. A little while back, NASA started concept studies with its contractors for a crew exploration vehicle capable of carrying humans beyond low Earth orbit. And this produced a variety of concept designs, although I suspect no defined system purpose. Then in 2005, it issued a request for proposals with a specification and a concept design. And what did it get back? Well, dead ringer concepts from the competing teams, of course. After all, what company is going to risk something radically different with so much at stake? It's an interesting what if. What if NASA had just released the specification and the contractors had to come up with their own concept designs to meet it? Would we have had such uniformity then? And in the actual world, what we ended up with is the Orion capsule. Although to be fair to NASA, the competing commercial systems to deliver cargo and crew to the ISS do better match up to the ideal I'm suggesting here. And look at the variety of design concepts that have been produced as a result. So I am arguing that the teams with the design authority should be free to determine the system design based on their trade-offs, other optimization processes, and in the end, just simple engineering flair, and should be free to ignore the concept and feasibility designs. When I produced this post-ISS architecture design for a space station, it was as a demonstration that the approach of multiple small space stations was a cheaper and more effective approach to an in-orbit infrastructure development. I certainly did not intend it to be the blueprint that would then be slavishly followed if the ideas of the study were pursued. I would not expect the end result to look anything like this. And thus one should expect the end product to have a very different design, indeed therefore a very different look to the one that was produced at the start of the project in phase zero and phase A. For example, here is the original 1980s HOTOL concept design before it was even called HOTOL, compared with Skylon, which is where this project ended up. Once customers for spacecraft have their requirement specifications, they can then ask for proposals from the people who can actually make them. If there is a competition between commercial firms, then these firms can come up with very different designs internally, but the boundary and system interfaces will be the same. What a system design does is to establish the elements that make up the system and define the interfaces between them. We can now see past the system boundary into how the system is going to work. This is the system level. It is the level one person can understand and control. Later in the process, these elements will themselves have the system model applied to them and become subsystems, but not yet. These system designs are the key output of phase B. Again, I take issue with what both space agencies have called them. They both have used the term preliminary, and this is misleading as it implies it is temporary and can be replaced later. And that should not be the case. Once a system design has gone through a preliminary design review, which is at the end of phase B, it should be frozen, never to be changed. If it is subsequently changed later in the program, you should in theory at least go back to the start of phase C. Just as if you change the requirement specification after the end of phase A, you should go back to the start of phase B. One of the ways in which the system design is defined are the element requirement specifications. In a spacecraft, these are often known as the subsystem specifications, and these are the key inputs into phase C. Phase C is variously known as the detailed or final design phase, and is the phase where all the various elements defined in phase B are realized as proven designs with manufacturing drawings or the equivalent, enabling the whole system to be constructed. 
we now have a complete system model which is scattered across maybe thousands of people and many organisations. But the progression of the life cycle should ensure that when all the elements are assembled together, a working system will result. Classically, the detailed design phase is followed by the production phase, where the system, as defined by the full design, is built. But once again, I am taking issue with the ESA terminology. And to explain my problem here, we need to return to the subject of verification. There are two aspects to verification. One is qualification, which is proving the design, if ideally realised, will meet the requirement specification. And it should be achieved at the critical design review that is the closeout of phase C. And that should freeze the spacecraft design. So why is ESA moving qualification into phase D? Or for that matter, why does NASA do element fabrication in phase C before the final design has been proven? In a classic industry like cars or aircraft, the system design would be used to make prototypes during the detailed design phase that are then tested. And those test results are a substantial part of demonstrating qualification. But when you're making only one or two spacecraft, making prototypes as well will very significantly add to the program's cost. So we have concepts like proto-flight, where the qualification testing is conducted on the flight models, and so there has to be a blurring of the normally firm rule not to move into the production phase before the design is fully qualified in the detailed design phase. This very small production run mentality, which is institutionalized in the space version of the life cycle, is a key problem with the space industry. If making one or two of a system design is viewed as the norm, we are never going to break out of the economics of small production runs into large production runs, and space will forever be expensive and also unreliable as we're not using designs with long operational histories. But at least we can all agree that the end of the production phase is acceptance. When the system is proven as actually built to have met the requirement specification. And even I am not going to argue with that. Phase E is started once the spacecraft is in its proper orbit and shown to be working, the final stage of the acceptance process. It is of course the most important phase because this is where the system fulfills its purpose. To use an analogy, the development phases A to D are like a person's education successively preparing them to do a job in society. In phase E, our spacecraft has got to do the job for which it was prepared. As the space version of the system life cycle is very mission orientated, it is perhaps not surprising that by and large our missions are successful, at least in terms of meeting what is laid out in the requirement specification. But like everything in this universe, nothing lasts forever. And so when its life is over, we must finally put our spacecraft out of its misery. And so we come to the last and least loved phase, disposal or decommissioning. The fact that NASA has only recently added it as a separate phase in its own right highlights that this is the phase everyone likes to forget, particularly in the early phases of a project. After all, it's rather like making the funeral arrangements for the baby at the christening. It doesn't seem right somehow, almost indecent. And so there is a tendency not to pay proper attention to generating a realistic way of disposing of the system at the start of the programme. After all, it is decades away and everyone will have been paid long before this event arrives. But this is wrong. It is important that a proper and feasible decommissioning process that is consistent with the objectives and is costed in the life cycle is incorporated into the requirements in phase A and integrated into the system design in phase B. The mess in Earth orbit is a testament to how badly our industry has managed disposal. The attitude that space was big enough to be treated as just a giant waste dump has come back to haunt us, as we now have to operate our spacecraft in that waste dump. The problem is that disposal of spacecraft in general is very difficult 
and in turn that means that it is very expensive and normally in phase A really effective disposal methods may be looked at but then there's a sharp intake of breath as the cost of doing this emerges and then some ineffectual but much cheaper method is selected. The problem is that we have now got to clean up our mess and that is going to be expensive. I have been on a team looking at the case of geostationary orbit and it is looking like the cost of removing a dead satellite is comparable to the cost of building and launching it in the first place. My point being that this should have been identified in the satellite's phase A, if not in the concept study, and not decades after it has died. Well, that concludes my rant about the key features of the way space systems engineering is conducted in the space industry. As I have said, by and large, it's a story of success, which is just as well, given how much money that is spent achieving it. And as I argued earlier, systems engineering is the key factor in achieving this success. But I do not think that we have reached anywhere near some pinnacle of perfection. I am concerned about the drift of the space agency life cycles away from the classic system engineering waterfall process. It may seem petty to criticise something that by and large has been so successful, but I think it shows that there has been a lack of understanding about the theory. We may be smoothing the rough, awkward edges that a more theoretical approach would leave, and doing this by redefining our processes so they better match to the real world and what we have found works. But it also has the effect of ossifying our practices, the good and the bad. If the procedures are too convenient, we start to follow them unthinkingly, and this leaves the industry inflexible and difficult to change. It means that we are no longer really able to address new issues that arise when we use the system model to face new challenges.